How many of us tend to Google every time you face a difficult problem? Maybe if, if you're holding an iPhone, how many of us turn to Siri? Hey Siri, I can't find matching socks. <laughs> what should I do? We all do this, yes? Um, but what if Siri or Google don't offer us the solution that we seek? Where do you tend to? Personally, I believe that the answer lies within you because I have found myself in these situations many times. I grew up in the dusty streets of Athi River. Athi River is an industrial town on the outskirts of Nairobi, which is Kenya's capital city. And I remember when it rained, me and my partners in crime would run outside and play in the mud and we'd jump in mud puddles just when the mud was fresh and we'd make mud sculptures and at the end of the day my mom would come and fetch us and she'd beat us and she'd be like why are you playing in the mud I wash your clothes many African children can relate to this story but in these times I really enjoyed these experiences I really enjoyed waking up in the morning and all I could do all day is make mud sculptures and play in the mud. And I imagine myself making even bigger sculptures in future. But Athi River was not the place where you grow up wanting to do these things. Athi River is not the place where you grow up and say, I want to be a designer. Why? It's because there's a common expectation. Being in an industrial town, you're expected to graduate high school and then join one of the industries. For instance, cement manufacturing. Or if you're lucky enough, if your parent is a teacher, you join a polytechnic and you study science. And it was really hard for me to find people that share the same ambition, people that want to be designers. And I remember during the end of my primary school education, I constantly asked myself, what if I had the courage to pursue what I'm really passionate about. What would happen? What would my mom and dad say? And in 2007, this was Kenya, we faced the worst post-election violence. Our political leaders had split the country along tribal lines just because People in Kenya come from different tribes. And I remember my neighbors, who I used to play with when I was a kid, suddenly took up machetes and killed each other just because we were from a different tribe. And it was really clear that the linear thinking of our leaders is leading us nowhere. And one incident that really hurt me was mothers and children who sought refuge in churches were burnt alive and they were forced to evacuate and what I did about this was that I was 12 years at the time and I felt challenged to step up I knew that my leaders would not take us anywhere but I knew that I could create mud sculptures I could creatively design something and help my community emerged from this dark chapter. So I remember that after the war had died down, I went to one of the badly affected communities in Nairobi. And what I did was I collected bullet shells that were scattered along the streets. And I turned these bullet shells into necklaces. And those that bought these necklaces were reminded of Kenya's dark chapter. They're reminded that the linear thinking of our leaders is leading us nowhere. And it reminded them of the missing child at the dinner table. It reminded them of the missing dad who had died protecting his family's dignity. But this time, I found people that shared my ambition. I remember together with a group of artists, we had a bi-monthly art gallery on the streets of Nairobi, dubbed Picha Mtani. Picha is Swahili for art. 
and Tani is straight, so art on the street. And on the streets of Nairobi, we did artwork and bullet necklaces where citizens would walk in at the end of the day, after a busy day of work, and come in and look at how war had broken my nation. Our artwork told the story of Kenya's dark chapter, but it gave us hope. It told Kenyans that we are custodians of our own safety. And together as brothers, we must heal a nation. And this was just the beginning of something really amazing. What came out of this, us embracing social change, truly changed my life. And in 2013, I was just finishing high school. Most of my peers had already joined local industries, already making money, and some were studying sciences and wanted to be mechanics in garages. And I sat home in a crisis. What can I do? I do not want to work in these industries. And it, it's in this moment that I realized something about Kenya and something about communities across Africa. We were facing a new problem. We were facing a new struggle. This is a dump site in Arthur River. So I realized two things. One, communities like Arthur River across Africa are facing a new kind of waste, which is electronic waste. And two, people like him who work in these areas have their lifespan reduced by 25 years of age. And I want us to pause for a minute and think, where does this waste come from. We all owned a Nokia 3310 back in the day, or the Sony Ericsson that had really long antennas. So what happened to them? Where did you take it? What you probably did was you threw it away. And what you did there was you created electronic waste. And it's not only you that are doing that. Millions of people across the world are creating this electronic waste crisis, and no one is doing anything about it. No one is banning the US or China from coming into Africa and dumping this waste. Just to give you a picture of how bad this is, last year I was reading a report on, by the UN. It says that we produce 41 million tons of electronic waste every year, but we can only recycle 6 million. At River being no exception, the industries around us, the cement factories, dumped e-waste in places I used to play. Kids could no longer enjoy the same serenity that I enjoyed growing up. And this drove me to begin a company called eLab at the age of 19. And what eLab did was, eLab went to such communities across Kenya, and it identified this kind of waste, electronic waste. And we turned electronic waste into pieces of art, like jewelry and furniture for the fashion industry and the interior design industry. Within one year, in 2014, Elab grew from a backyard startup where I worked in my garage to a fully operational company when we had the capacity to eradicate 2,000 tons of electronic waste. And this is something that... <clears throat> this is something that the environmental docket in Kenya has failed to do. This is something that... This is a policy that the environmental docket in many African countries has failed to implement. And some of the pieces here have been showcased um, in 2015 in the New York and the Milan Fashion Week. And these platforms have given us a global stage to inspire change. And we're now able to create a global culture where people are now disposing of electronic waste responsibly. And right now, we are more than a company. Elab is a movement. We're seeing people that grew up like me wanting to be designers but their parents constantly said no, or they did not have the funds to do so, can now come into ELAB and design 
for a social cause. They can now champion a social cause. And one thing, last year, we employed 100 women from my community who were creating jewelry and selling them to local markets. These women came on board and can now create jewelry using electronic waste. So one thing, they have employment opportunities. And two, they're championing a social cause so that their kids can now enjoy the same serenity that I grew up in. And this is a three river right now. Kids can now play safely. No much e-waste. But that's not the end of the story. Kenya is a big country. I still have more work to do. And Africa is a big continent. I still have the whole of Africa to conquer. And the world is a big place. <laughs> I still have the world to conquer. Um, just recently, my crazy concept has been featured on media houses like CNN, Al Jazeera, and the BBC for its unique way of handling waste. Who would have ever thought that your old Nokia 3310 can be a necklace and can be showcased in the New York Fashion Week? And just recently, I received something really humbling. It's an award given by the Her Majesty the Queen of England called the Queen Young Leaders Award. She identifies young leaders across the world who are embracing change and doing something in their communities that sparks change. And we're seeing designers like me across Africa designing for social change. We're seeing things like M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a money sending platform that enables you to send money instantly and cheaply across the continent. And my challenge to you today is embrace design thinking because I believe that design thinking is a catalyst for evolution in this time that we live in. So you might wonder, how is Alex doing all these things? How are these designers coming on board and doing all these things? Over the years, I've discovered two powerful tools that have enabled me to do all these things. One, the 40% rule. This is a really simple technique. It's used by the Navy SEALs in times of battle. And how it works is that sometimes at work or at school, you might feel that you've given 100% of your energy or as a writer, you've given 100% of your abilities into writing a book. But in these times, I've discovered that you've only done 40% of what you're capable of. And the remaining 60% can literally outstand you if you reach down deep and exploit it. And two, it's being a child. It's embracing a beginner's mindset. It's not forgetting how I grew up in a river. It's having the same mentality I had as a kid, where I questioned the world around me. I asked my government, why are you not doing anything about waste? And again, being a kid, I want to create things. So I end up embracing design thinking and creating solutions that impact humanity. And just recently, while I was reflecting on this two powerful tools, I came across a huge problem. Did you know that the price of a prosthetic limb costs between $3,000 and $70,000? And what I'm gonna do about it is, I am going to create quality and affordable prosthetic limbs for the healthcare sector across Africa using recycled electronics. It's something that is not being done, but why not? And <laughs> and as you sit in the audience and reflect on how you can use these powerful tools, think about how you can advance the next problem, how you can transcend the next problem in your community. So the next time you face a difficult problem, are you going to go to Google or Siri? 
<laughs> no, the answer lies within you. My name is Alex Motivo. And I am a designer. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs>